Yeah, despite the BT sponsorship, I'm going to show you I'm not here to shill for OpenReach, but uh, this presentation is mostly about OpenReach. Um, so my name's Simon Green. Uh, I'm from Wirehive and 1310. Um, I'm the CTO at Wirehive, one of the original founders, um, career sysadmin turned business owner, as a lot of people in our business tend to be. And I'm also non-exec to a few startups as well on the side. Um, I've been in the hosting side of uh, the internet for about 20 years, if I count going back to college as well, uh, running a little uh, mail server under my bed off my, out of my parents' house. Uh, that's where it kind of all started. But I've been working on hosting for a long time, football club websites, public service sector stuff, um, famous brands, a lot of marketing agencies, that sort of thing. Um, and um, something I'd always wanted to do since I was a teenager, really, because uh, apparently I'm a, I hate myself, is I wanted to get into building an access side, ISP. Um, I was, you know, followed companies like uh, Zen from the early days and the things they were doing, and that was what I always wanted to try and get into. But it always felt like it was a, an unobtainable thing. So a bit about 1310. Hopefully you will get the name. If you don't, I'm sure someone in the chat will enlighten you shortly. Um, we're a small uh, five people at the moment ISP and we're just trying to really just do interesting and creative things for providing internet, uh, for providing internet access. We use a variety of different methods but primarily in order of preference where possible we will build on our own fiber so in uh, business parks for example we'll use open reach as the lowest level of BT we can go to or we'll use wholesale. So how did this start? <clears throat> Wirehive is a traditional uh, managed service provider. Uh, used to work on IT, um, do a lot of you know the exchange type things, office IT, so on and so forth. Um, and we, as part of that, resold connectivity for a long time from the larger players that you've heard of, like Exponentially and Colt and companies like that. Um, we had a customer near the office um, who was. It was it was renewal time basically. They were um, they were due for their renewal with whoever they were with at the time, and um, kind of got thinking about it. Rather than just do them with the same thing, I thought to myself, how hard can this be if we want to do it ourselves soon? <laughs> so it's worth a bit of a refresher for those who don't uh, don't know, have seen haven't seen it for a while, haven't talked about it in a while about what the UK telco market looks like for ISPs. And I'm going to start with the open reach stack and the BT world. Um, by the way, this is this is very broad examples. And this is um, you can get a hell of a lot more detailed into this, but this is just like a really high level overview. You've got the layer one people at the top, um, like like open reach, who provide to the likes of BT wholesale, talk talk, and so on, who in turn sell to the likes of BT retail and all the other High Street ISPs you may have heard of. Um, this is this is a the, the full channel model where you've got this this division in stacks uh, of different companies providing different layers to each other. The third type is you've got a, a nationwide direct type business. So um, OpenReach sell their infrastructure to TalkTalk, Talk, who sell direct to the consumers, and you've got a few players who do this sort of thing. You know, this is how Sky operate as well, um, and then. Uh, you've also got the, the the flip side of that. You've got companies like OFNL or um, Surrey Hills or people like that who are, they're putting fiber in the ground, building an open reach alternative, creating a wholesale network on top of that, and then selling that in a resale way to high street names who can then sell it to consumers. So you find some small independents as well in, in this branch here, as well as some of the big aggregators like uh, you know Virtual One and companies like that. And then lastly, you've got the, the completely vertically integrated people like Virgin Media and GigaClear who put their own stuff in the ground. They will also potentially sell it to wholesale, um, but they will sell all the way through to end consumers. This is also where you see the likes of the, the smaller startups in, the like, in places like Scotland and Wales and the Midlands and stuff where, uh, you know, B4RN and companies like that who are challenging what's already there and putting their own stuff in. So there's a lot of different shapes of ways that you can get into, get into the market, a lot of different entry points. Um, personally, I think actually the UK has a very capable and flexible 
telco market. Uh, there's there's all sorts of things you can do. There's a lot of regulation that allows you entry to different points as well as allows you to do your own thing at different points. Um, it's, it's pretty good. The further up that stack you choose to go, um, I guess you could say the more difficult your job would be, depending on your perspective, um, but also the more, <coughs> excuse me, the more control over what you'll be able to do as well, because you've got lower level access to things. It's a bit like, you know, working your way down the OSAI stack, I guess you could call it the, uh, the BT stack model, right? Our um, OpenReach, on OpenReach specifically, it's a pretty unique business in the UK, not because of what they do. There are other businesses who run infrastructure in the ground, but um, they're part, they were, they're part of BT, we're part of BT, are part of BT, etc. BT group, but they, um, they get told basically by OpenReach, these are the things you can sell, this is how you will price them, and this is who you will sell them to. And it creates a very, um, a very level playing field for people who want to engage with them. Um, they are a bit of a gold mine if you can figure out how to tap, how to tap it. Uh, what you need to do. The work that Ofcom did, I believe, was a brilliant thing in creating this situation. Our day one principles, what we wanted to do as 1310, uh, was go as low level as we could at any point in time, um, you know, based on the knowledge that we have, what we're physically able or have the capacity to do. Um, we, wanted to, we wanted to keep going as low as we could. Now, that didn't mean we would hold ourselves back because we didn't know how to do something. We might use outsourced people or we might just not do something because it's too difficult or we don't understand it yet. But we always wanted to keep trying to channel down as far as we could. Hard mode, I guess you could call it. We want to scope quite tight. Um, so we'll come up with a design. This is, this is what we're going to build. It's going to deliver to these specs. We're not going to, we're not going to overbuild this with huge quantities of big iron providers all over the place when we don't need it. Not going to overcapacity it. We're also not going to overfill it. We're not going to allow something that we've scoped to be this side to go beyond its means. And we also didn't want to do something the same way that other people are doing it just because that's a tried and tested method. We didn't want to be me too about it. We're doing our own thing. So, um, oh, and, and also I haven't got it in the slide, but we also decided not to go the investment funded route. Um, you know, we could have come up with a plan and gone on to investors, either um, local or angels or the like, and said, we want to, you know, we want to do this thing in this area. Please provide us the capital, to go and do this. We wanted to be able to do it at the start in our own time without any external pressures on us um, so that we could take our time exploring it, find the optimal paths through. We're in quite a privileged position uh, because um, I can lean a lot on the existing business, which is Wirehive, um, for some existing networks. So we didn't have to start from completely the ground up. We had things like a trading history and so on, but I will come on to that sort of thing later. So step one, become an open reach customer. The first part of that is getting someone to reply to an email or pick up the phone, uh, which is pretty challenging. Um, but if you just keep trying, you will eventually get through to usually the SRM team, the sales relationship management team, but you get someone to respond to you. And then this word here, establish, is a word that you'll come across a lot when working with OpenReach. But once you understand what this means, this magical word, then you're, then you're rolling. Dealing with OpenReach isn't actually like any other business that I've dealt with before. Um, it's, it's as if you always had a right the whole time to deal with this company but you'd never met, muttered the correct incantation in the right direction and suddenly started working with them. It's like they are just sat there ready to use. Um, establish in open reach terms means make someone open reach actually start doing a thing to provide something. Um, you wanna establish for GEA before you can start providing FTTP, you wanna establish for ethernet before you can start providing EADs and, and so on. There's a lot of, lot of products and I've got some stuff on that later, but establish is a key word for you. When you're establishing for a product, there are some key steps you've got to go through. First, you've got to pass some fairly serious credit vetting. Um, I don't believe they put these things in there as hurdles to stop people from doing business with them. I think it's simply that they are a business who's geared up to deal with a certain size and scale of customer, and they don't have, at the pricing that they're selling and so on, they don't have the, the capacity and the processes and the, the relationship people and so on to deal with, um, I'm going to say time wasters, but I don't mean it that way. I mean, you've got to know what you're, you've got to be established as a business for open reach to enjoy dealing with you, I suppose. So you've got to pass some fairly, fairly serious credit vetting. Um, 
They may ask for deposits or prepayments. Um, it's usually about £10,000 from what I found from speaking to other people. It's around that. And that's that would be a prepayment that has to be spent within your first year. And it's like a commitment to do business with OpenReach, essentially. You have to provide growth projections on the products that you want to unbundle, uh, establish with, sorry. Um, so this is how much I intend to do in three months, six months, 12 months, two years, and so on. I believe that then feeds into their product development side so that they can make sure they have capacity. Um, there are, they, they interestingly in the T's and C's, I believe they have penalties or, or certainly the, you're in breach if you go under that, but also if you go over that. So if you place, if you say you're only going to order 10 lines, but you order a thousand lines with them, while well, you think that would be a good problem to have, I guess they're, they're thinking about capacity. You just have to tell them in advance, but you can maintain that. You have some basic product training you have to do. So if you want to sell phone lines through them, for example, you have to go through the training to make sure that you know how to use their systems adequately and you're not going to become a, a burden on their support side with requests where they can just say you need to read the manual here and things like that. Um, most of their products have that basic product training requirement in them and you've got to uh, approve it. Uh, you've got to prove that you can pass various things that's in your spreadsheet of tests. And then you place an initial order. Um, some products like LLU need you to place an initial order as part of establishment. It's like the final step. Whereas other products like uh, GEA, for example, um, that doesn't need you to place an order. You've, you're established and then when you've got a customer, you can place it. LLU also on top of this requires some fairly steep insurance. Uh, I think you need 10 million pounds of public liability insurance. You've got to approve, you've got to, um, a test that your engineers are sensible and aren't gonna, you know, go take a hatchet to the exchange and things like that. There are quite a lot of products available through OpenReach. Um, this list is the result of a quick skim that I took through the product section of the website to give you an idea. All of these have detailed price lists going down into crazy detail. Uh, for example, on LLU, it tells you how much per meter the um, floor space is and the air conditioning cost is and how much your power is in different ways and things like that. There's a price for the door on the cabinet. There's a price for a different type of lock on the cabinet. Pretty much everything you can think of, they've thought of, and so there's a price for it. You can think of each product, or certainly each product set, a bit like its own mini business. You need to enable for each product set separately. Most of the people on the open reach side uh, of the, in these departments that I've spoken to, they don't really seem to know much about what the other departments do necessarily, unless they have to interact with them. Um, and a lot of departments as well, they don't self-identify in the way that OpenReach pitch them externally. So you could phone a phone number that the uh, customer support plan tells you to call, for example, end up speaking to someone um, and they will identify as something else. And you'll have to talk about the, the specific thing, not the product name, or you just confuse them. There are some very, very niche departments that you end up encountering. Uh, the, by far the most niche that I've encountered was a department who places and drives orders for the phone lines that will end up with GEA on top of them that will be used to monitor EAD circuits. And that's all they do. Phenomenally specific. Um, Simon, if I may just uh, quickly, there's, there's about nine minutes left of speaking time for the slot. And I, I noticed there's quite a few slides on there um, to get through. Um, well, I'd best power on then, then. <laughs> I will power through. Good, good man. Um, so these are the products that we want to start with, Access, Locate, and EAD. Um, these are the ones that we really need to begin with. Access, Locate, you can think of as Colo and the Telephone Exchange. It's available in a variety of different configurations, um, but what you want to look for is FCP, which is flexible co-mingling. It looks a bit like a rack from a data center, but a little bit smaller. Um, I'm going to skip over that. This is what an Access Locate cabinet looks like. Well, it's actually two side by side, a slightly deeper one. Um, it's in the M MUA area of the exchange when you get there. Um, they're not particularly nice places to be. Um, you know, I used to think working in the cold aisle of an old data center was a particularly unpleasant place to be, but these are, these are something else because they're, they're either cold or hot, usually dirty, there's usually detritus over the floor, leftover cuttings, fiber bits, cable bits, bits of metal and so on. But very functional, you get in there um, and you've got a rack and you can do with it as you please really within, uh, well, within comms reasons, if you're putting comms stuff in it. The other half of the product is ethernet. 
Ethernet gives you access to EAD, which you've almost definitely heard of. Um, it's point-to-point -point fiber with a combination media converter and quality monitoring on the end of it. Um, there's fiber running all over the place. And the EAD product connects it all up, puts an NTE on the ends, and um, gives you a circuit. Um, you've got these are different components. I'm speeding through a bit, sorry now. Um, these are different components. This is what an NTE chassis looks like. You've got these nodes in the ground with fiber, which are dotted around all over the place. This is what it looks like on the exchange end. These are the fly fiber blowing tubes that end up going to the properties. You also get access to a nice mapping tool to be able to do a bit of desk survey and see where everything is going to go. That's the infrastructure map tool. Um, this is what a cabinet in the exchange ends up looking like when you've got it full of EADs. You've got these uh, fiber tray down the bottom here, and then these EAD chassis all the way up that give you the, give you the cards. The, these are vertical versions of these that sit in the exchanges. And so once you've got that, and we also did an EAD from the customer, so EAD from the customer to the local exchange, and then the local exchange back to the local data center where we are, now we're an ISP. We are providing connectivity. When you're not able to do it with EAD, though, you've got to think about backhaul. OpenReach has some backhaul options when you're, when you're dealing with it. You've got EBD, which is Ethernet Backhaul Direct. Um, this is an example snippet here that I generated, but all the exchanges have two or more, well, most exchanges have two or more locations that you can backhaul to with EBD. Um, it does have a version that allows you to hop through exchanges as well. You can also use regular EADs if you're within range of the exchanges or OSA, which is their um, WDM product. Also, there are other providers available around the exchanges. You've got them in and adjacent to. There are ways of connecting to them. Um, I'm not going to go through the detail on this slide, but feel free to download it from the from the UK NAF website. But there are you can connect out to Zayo and SSE and then use them or similar and use them as backhaul if you like. Backhaul is the biggest challenge when you're unbundling exchanges. We chose ours specifically with backhaul as the primary consideration uh, because it is a bit of a pain. They're not like regular data centers. As we were in the exchange, we also obviously went for the GEA products, FTTP and FTTC and so on. Um, GEA, um, OpenReach GEA is a fantastic product and I'm not a lot of people realize that it is pretty much a reference implementation for the standard TR101. This bit of the TR101 standard, which I highly advise you to read, um, is what OpenReach provide. The way it works is you've got layer two switches in the exchange which connect out to either cabinets, OLTs for FTTP, GFAST cabinets. Um, not in a one-to-one, -one, more like a one-to-many. You've got some cabinets attached to a layer two switch. The CP connects to those layer two switches with GEA cable links. And then the customers connect into the various services on the end of that. Um, and what you end up with um, over the top of that essentially is a transparent-ish layer two circuit that you can, within reason, do whatever you want over it. And this is one of the big differences between doing it wholesale layer and with OpenReach is over that you can bond them together with LACP if you want. You can do IPX over it if you chose to. You can do anything you want over it because it is just a VLAN to you. It's a, it's a queuing queue VLAN, but it's a VLAN. If you choose to use PPP or DHCP, the DSLAM puts some, in, some useful information in there as well to help you out. You've got a remote ID, which you specify when you order a circuit which specifies where it's coming from, and also the line rates, which allows you to build queues at your BNG. You connect to those things, as I said, with cable link. You order cable links from OpenReach and they deliver them to your rack as bundles of fiber like this. Uh, and uh, it's a pair of LCs. And then you specify which cable link you want the circuit to come to. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide because of time. So, Pros and cons, as I found, of, of dealing with OpenReach. They are very predictable. Whether that be a good thing or a bad thing, you, you get a pretty good feeling in advance how it's going to go. Um, after you've got some experience, you know if an order is going to be on the happy path or not. Uh, and if it is, you know how it's going to happen. Very transparent on the products. You know what you're going to get. There's nothing that you can do, really, that someone else hasn't already thought of, and they've either got a yes or a no about. And if they've got a yes, they've got a process. Um, when you're doing normal things through them, it does just work, it is quite smooth, and there's no wholesale layer to deal with, which is a benefit. On the con side, they won't do anything they don't have to do. If you can get them to do something that they don't have to do, you will have fallen firmly off the happy path and now things might go wrong with you. You will end up with 
shims in place where you've persuaded an engineer to do a thing and then you won't have a way of getting that fixed later or worked with later. Um, very steep learning curve. There's a hell of a lot of detail. I've just touched the tip of the iceberg on this, but there's a lot to learn in order to work with OpenReach effectively and efficiently. Weird things can go wrong. Um, if you if something goes ever so slightly wrong, you end up on chat support agents or phoning people trying to get it fixed. And obviously I mentioned about backhaul as well. Um, in my opinion, wholesalers spoil the value that you can get from OpenReach. There's a hell of a lot you can get out of it. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot to be had from them direct. Um, I've got a slide in here about what it costs, but I'm gonna just let you download the PowerPoint on that because of time. Um, my tips, there's a lot of data in the OpenReach portal. You wanna get it and store it. Um, it, may, it may not be as easy to find later. You'll forget where you found it. It is a maze of a website. Um, and with that data, learn Power BI and some kind of SQL, because once you get that data, you wanna be able to process it and use it well. Ask the build team about cease to pop reuse. You can get a LLU rack for about half the price through this program. It's where you use space that already exists. Everything has a price and the price lists are available. So you wanna go find them and, and use them. Expect it to go wrong at the start because you don't know what you're doing. It's not them, it's almost always you. You've done something wrong, clicked the wrong button, filled the wrong box in. Order ADSL into your rack for out of band. It will confuse the engineer, but order it from someone else like Andrews and Arnold and get it in there so you've got a back door in because you don't wanna have to go to the exchange if you don't have to. Um, uh, build an address book as well. Um, you'll make a lot of contacts. Um, every time you come across someone useful, note down their name and number. Most people I have spoken to at OpenReach, overwhelming majority, are incredibly helpful and nice people, and they just want to help you, um, and they're really useful to speak to. So just make your own address book out of those contacts. There are some shakeups to come. Um, have a Google for this, which is the uh, Wholesale Fixed Telecoms Market Review. Um, I'm going to skim through it again because of time. Um, I didn't realize this would be so long, but um, they are creating some geographic area classes that will affect open reach and infrastructure delivery. Have a look for it. There's also a new dark fiber product coming, which is based around EAD stuff, according to Ofcom anyway. Um, and the wholesale side is being deregulated, which I believe means no more market A, market B thing for BT wholesale, but have a look at, have a look at that, um, look at that online. If you wanna know more, um, we've got a fantastic channel on the Altnet UK Slack go and join, ask for help. Um, there's some very helpful people in there. There's about 100 ISP owners. Um, no sales, no marketing, you'll get booted for that. No tech elitism. Google the OpenReach uh, SINs, S-I-N-S. Those are the documents that lay out the tech spec of how it works, um, how the product works that you're gonna be using. Read TR101 if GEA is what you're interested in. If you're interested in FTTC and FTTP, I highly advise reading TR101. It might seem like it's a bit of a daunting document, but the OpenReach implementation, as I said, is pretty much the reference implementation from that. And it goes into a lot of detail and tells you what to expect. Or if I'm allowed with the time left, ask me questions now. Thank you very much, Simon. That was an excellent, uh, <clears throat> an excellent overview, if I do say so myself. I have no idea where the first 20 minutes went. Uh, it, it was, um, I think it was exceptionally interesting, very conversational. Uh, I think it's just, this is a, such a broad, huge topic. that I mean, you, I, I'm sure anyone, you know, subtly it, dipped in open reach could talk about it for a few hours it is um, massive if this, <laughs> if this picture here went down to to the bottom here with the iceberg it would be more realistic it's that <laughs> there's a lot um, to it we, we do have some minutes for questions we have th th three minutes for questions and uh, uh, if i would hand over to james um mm -hmm. if he's there sure yeah if anyone wants to submit questions please use the q a feature in zoom to throw questions in um so simon we've had one question come in from james blessing um, he asks, are you looking forward to the redesign of the OpenReach portal? No, I've just learned it all. <laughs> there is a redesign coming and I now know my way around it. And there's some, you could probably ask me a question about OpenReach and in the time it would take you to type out the response, I could probably bang through the OpenReach website and find it now. But it is a nightmare. It'll probably be better for people who are joining. Yeah, uh, they're also adding um, single sign-on with Azure AD, which I've seen as well, which is interesting. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I've got one more question coming uh, from Steve Wright. If you were starting again, what would you do differently? Hi, Steve. Um, what would I do differently? I don't know. Maybe I would go a little bit bigger 
in my initial scoped design rather than constraining myself because there are some things that benefit from a little bit of scale. Um, but to be honest, not a lot differently. We took our time. Um, I, I wouldn't want to really say that we got a lot wrong. Okay, that's the end of the questions. I think if anyone has more questions later, Simon's probably going to be around. I just saw um, a, a thing in the chat from Mike saying a workshop on this from different CPs that buy through OpenReach would be great. Join that Slack channel. It, there's so much to learn from there. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you, James. And um, thank you very much, Simon. Again, really a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much for um, coming along and uh, persevering to to give us that one that was that was fantastic mm -hmm. so i appreciate it